We'll start with some probability theory in this first lecture, and then we'll get more into some of the practical ways that we use it and apply it. So we're going to cover a couple of things in this lecture. Um, we're going to talk about what a probability is and what it means. I think that's kind of foundational to make sure we're all on the same page on understanding what, it, what we mean when we talk about probabilities. We're going to discuss different types of probabilities, and, and basically there's kind of two generally accepted interpretations of probability um, that we have today. Um, so we'll talk about both of those, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, a little bit about how probabilities can be used and, uh, and can be useful to us in a risk analysis. So we'll talk about marginal probabilities, um, conditional probabilities, and again, a few of these we touched on yesterday. We'll talk about joint probabilities and then two types, uh, two, or two main classes of events, dependent events and independent events. All right, so probability theory. So what is what is what does probability theory do for us? All right, so probability theory uh, gives us a it's just a mathematical framework um, that gives us the tools we need to um, put numbers and estimates to risk. Um, so it includes things like estimating the likelihood that some event will occur, um, the likelihood that our our opinion or judgment about um, some condition or event is true, um, and it also gives us all the all the different calculations that we need to combine all these um, things into a cohesive risk estimate. And we touched on Venn diagrams yesterday, so again, just just to refresh, so um, Venn diagrams can be used to portray events and their probabilities um, by scaling the size of the um, Venn diagram so that um, things are sized proportional to their probabilities. So uh, usually we call that a probability space. Um, so we saw some of that yesterday, right? So in this simple example, we have probability sum of an A being 0.2, uh, the complement probability of not A being 0.8, and the total probability that covers the whole sample space always has to be 1. All right, I mentioned this in the introduction, um, two types of probabilities. Um, at various times in the past, there was other ones, more than two, but things have kind of settled into these two. Um, so most, the vast majority of folks um, view these as being the two primary interpretations of um, probabilities. And in some ways, they've been, you know, sometimes you'll see folks at odds with each other over these two types, um, my personal opinion is that both have a have a place and a role in risk analysis. So they're both um, useful, valuable. Each has its own strengths and uh, and weaknesses. Uh, the first type is a usually called a frequentist probability. Sometimes it's called a physical probability or an objective probability. If you've ever taken a um, course in probability and statistics, this is what traditionally gets taught in most probability and statistics courses is the frequentist uh, version of probability. And the general premise of frequentist probabilities is that they come from observed frequencies. So we observe things or we can, you know, and we can observe them in the real world, we can observe them in an experiment, we can observe them in a model, right? So observing them doesn't mean it has to be something that you know, we observe that actually happens, right? It can be things that are modeled um, as well. But it comes from observations. So simple example here, if we've observed at our dam that we the spillway has discharged, you know, uh, twice every 10 years, then our annual probability of spillway flow would be something like 2 over 10, right, or 0.2. Um, the other type of probability is typically called a subjective probability, but you also see terms like evidential or degree of belief is pretty common. Uh, Bayesian, Bayesian is really common um, terms used to describe this type of probability. So this type of probability comes from a uh, weighting of 
information and evidence about what it is we're trying to estimate. Um, another way, um, another way Bayesian uh, and subjective probabilities you can think of them is uh, one of the ways we can quantify them is your willingness to bet on a particular proposition. Um, so if there's a particular proposition and someone offers you, you know, some sort of bet with certain odds, um, the odds at, at which you would believe that that bet was a fair bet um, would be your subjective or Bayesian estimate of probability. So the way this is really, really common in risk analysis, um, and it's how we do uh, probability estimates when we do expert elicitations. So basically, you're, you're weighing all the information you have. So in this simple example here, we have some estimate of um, the probability that a monolith cracks based on, you know, the opinion of, of subject matter experts, based on what we know about how the monolith was designed and constructed, based upon, you know, uh, maybe core samples we've taken from the monolith and tested for their strength, based on some, you know, engineering analyses we've done, and maybe based on case histories and things we've observed at other similar dams, right? So it's not a direct result about um, things we've actually observed, but it's more of a personal belief um, based on your, really, as I said, the, the betting analogy, right, based on your willingness to, to take an action or take a bet um, based on your degree of belief in the likelihood of a particular event happening. So that's one of the criticisms of Bayesian is that there is a subjective element to it, but um, but the counter to that is, you know, you need an estimate, and if you don't have any data on which to base your estimate, you have to base it on something. And this is a, a formal way of um, coming up with that estimate. All right, we touched on these axioms yesterday in the pretest. So there's three fundamental rules for probability that from which everything else derives. So axioms are things that, you know, we can't necessarily like, you know, it doesn't mean it's truth, but it means we accept these to be true uh, and it's our foundation for, for probability and risk analysis. So touched on these yesterday, every probability has to be a real, real number greater than or equal to zero. Um, the probability for the sample space of a certain event is one, so again, combine those two. Um, the simple way of thinking of those first two is probabilities have to be between zero and one. And then the third one is where all the math comes from, is that if you have two mutually exclusive events and you take their union, union, remember, from yesterday means or, um, that probability is equal to the sum of the individual probabilities. And we'll see later that works out because there's no intersection between these two events if they're mutually exclusive. All right, let's get into some of the types of probabilities. So the first one we'll talk about is a marginal probability. So marginal probabilities are without any conditions placed on them. So when we're estimating the probability, uh, when we're estimating a marginal probability for an event, um, we're estimating it irrespective of any other event that's in our analysis. So we're basically ignoring um, any other event. Um, we typically do this in risk analysis when we estimate um, system response curves or probability of failure for failure modes, we typically um, estimate a marginal system response curve for each failure mode. So what that means is when we're estimating a probability of failure for a particular failure mode, we ignore the fact that other failure modes exist, right? We pretend they, essentially pretend they don't exist and, that, and we look at that one failure mode in isolation. And then later on in, in risk analysis and later steps, um, if failure modes are related to each other in some way, maybe maybe the strength is correlated, you know, between similar similar features on a dam or whatever it might be, um, we account for that later in how we uh, model risks and how we calculate our risk estimate. But for system response curves, um, we only estimate the marginal probability of failure. Um, 
some of that is because it's just easier that way to not have to think through all the interrelationships across the whole system. And the other thing, too, is that from a procedural standpoint, it just makes it um, much more consistent and easier um, to have a consistent process for how we um, arrive at those probability estimates. Second type we'll talk about here is conditional probability. So conditional probability is how we deal with dependence. So um, dependence means the probability of one event depends on um, the condition or occurrence of another event. So the way we talk about this is we talk about the probability of an event given. So given is usually the key word we use. Um, another event has occurred. Now, it again, it, the event either has actually occurred or, for example, in our risk model, we assume it has occurred, right? So if we're estimating the probability of failure um, given some magnitude of earthquake, um, we're assuming that earthquake has occurred and say, given that has occurred, then what is our probability of failure? So throughout uh, event trees and, and other methods that we use to come up with risk estimates, um, conditional probabilities are used a lot because we usually decompose our system into a sequence of events, and um, each event um, and its probability depends on what happened before it, right? So conditional probabilities are kind of fundamental um, in terms of how we construct our risk models. Next one is joint probability. So joint probability, um, and this is this ties back to intersection, which we talked about yesterday. So joint probability um, tells us something about the intersection of the events. So it tells us, you know, what's the probability of um, two events both occurring, or it can be more than two. Um, and again, in event trees and in risk analysis in general, right, when we decompose things into a sequence of events, usually we have a pathway where we have a, a collection of events that all have to occur um, to result in a failure of our dam or levy. So in those cases, when we're estimating, say, a total probability of failure, it's the joint probability of all the uh, uh, events that we've decomposed our failure mode into, right, is how we estimate that. Statistically dependent, so we've touched on this, I think, a little bit, but in a risk analysis, um, events are statistically dependent when the occurrence of one event does affect the probability of another event. So a couple of simple examples here. So probability of liquefaction of our embankment uh, probably depends on the, how big the earthquake was, right, so the peak ground acceleration. And, you know, for someone that's um, exposed to floodwaters uh, or a population at risk that, that might be exposed to a, to a breach, um, the fatality rate is going to depend on a number of factors, one of which is, is going to be warning, right? Did they get enough warning time to give them a, a chance of evacuating? And lots of other parameters go into that, but that's just one example. And again, uh, when we're constructing risk models, um, commonly, at least in the core, we use event trees. Um, we assume each event is dependent on the events that precede it. Independent um, is the last one we'll talk about here. So events are statistically independent when the occurrence of event does not have any effect on the probability for other events. Um, the way we write that mathematically is that P of A given B, so the probability of A um, given or conditional on event B occurring is just equal to P of A, which P of A is the marginal probability of A, right? So whether or not B occurs doesn't doesn't have any effect on what the estimate of probability of A is. So simple example here, let's say you're estimating the probability that there's some initiating flaw in your embankment. Um, whether or not that flaw exists, um, in a lot of cases, is going to be independent of the flood loading, right? So for every every possible flood loading scenario that you might have in your risk analysis, those might all have the same probability of a flaw because the flaw is either there or it's not, right? And uh, it doesn't necessarily depend on how big the flood was, whether or not it exists. Um, so lots of other examples you'll find throughout risk analysis for um, independent events. And again, as I mentioned, we usually assume um, Individual fa uh, individual failure modes are usually assumed and estimated as if they were um, independent 
which means we estimate their marginal uh, probabilities, at least when we're doing the system response curves. And then, like I said, if there is any dependence, we deal with that um, later in a risk model when we combine variables to get a total risk estimate.